Welcome back, everyone, to another reaction video. Well, we're going back to our friend, Mr. Beat. Uh, you've probably seen me do a couple of live streams with him. He's a great guy. We've gotten to know each other over the last couple of years, uh, including hanging out together in Denver last year. Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to do that again soon. But uh, with my upcoming trip to the UK here in a couple of weeks and with uh, the great love that I have for both England and Scotland, I'm excited to dive into his video, England and Scotland Compared. Uh, I actually, last year when I uh, was briefly in London with my daughter on our way to Paris, uh, Mr. Beat was with his family up in Scotland at that moment. So uh, we were in the UK briefly at the same time together. Uh, so I'm interested to see what he has to say about this. As always, the link is in the description to the original content. He is closing in on a million subscribers. Should happen in the next couple of months. So I'm excited for him to get that gold play button and hit that huge milestone. Richly deserved. Uh, he's been doing this for quite a while now. So let's go ahead and dive into this one. Thanks to YouGov for sponsoring this video. England and Scotland, two bordering countries part of a larger country called the United Kingdom, a country that has been pretty influential on the world over the past, I don't know, 300 years or so, both on the island of Great Britain, the ninth biggest island in the world. England and Scotland are the two most well-known and visited countries in the UK, and maybe by the end of this video, you'll have an opinion about which one you think is better. So so they have different things that make each one of them great, and I won't get into that too much until he goes into it. But of course, uh, if you're talking about Great Britain, it's gone through a lot of changes over time as far as the political structure. Um, England conquers Wales in the early part of the millennium, uh, like 12, 1300s. Um, so really, administratively speaking, Wales is kind of part of England at that point, even though it is still technically separate. Uh, and that's why you don't have the Welsh flag as part of the UK flag, which is really unfortunate because it's a dragon. And it might be the coolest flag that any country has. Um, but uh, England and Scotland are, are at war for a long time, back and forth. Our rivals, Scotland has what's called the Old Alliance, A-U-L-D, with, with France, which helps them a lot over the centuries. Uh, but when Elizabeth I dies in 1603... Uh, the throne passes to the nearest heir to the throne to her, which is her cousin, King James VI of Scotland, who becomes James I of England. And so now you have one king over both countries. So it's united under the one crown, but they're still two separate countries. Kind of like how um, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, others still have Charles III as their king, but they're a separate country. Same kind of deal. Um, but the two are then united politically in an act of union uh, in the early part of the 18th century uh, to become Great Britain. That's this whole island. Uh, and so they're Great Britain when uh, the, the American War for Independence happens. It's still Great Britain. Early 19th century, then you add Ireland to that and it becomes the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. Republic of Ireland breaks off in the 20th century and now it's the United Kingdom of Great Britain in Northern Ireland. So what else do they have in common? Both border the North Sea to the east and the Irish Sea to the west, but England borders the Celtic Sea to the west and English Channel to the south, and Scotland borders the Atlantic Ocean up here. Both have a bunch of smaller islands, although Scotland has quite a bit more. Yeah. At least 100 of Scotland's islands are completely uninhabited, by humans at least. Oh, uh, sorry, not islands. Islands. The locals call them Isles. Despite both being so far north on the globe, both have an oceanic temperate climate and both have long days in the summer and short, very dark days in the winter. Yeah, people don't realize how much further north the UK is than most places in the United States. Um, and so Scotland, for example, we were there in the summer last year. I guess it was 2022. Uh, we were there in the summer uh, up in the Isle of Skye, which is in the Inner Hebrides up here. There's these islands, the Inner Hebrides, the Outer Hebrides. Um, so we were on the Isle of Skye up here. And 11 o'clock at night, it was still kind of twilight a little bit. Like the sun wasn't completely down even at that point. But, of course, you have the reverse then when it comes to the wintertime. 
Both have milder climates compared to many other areas at similar latitudes True. due to the temperate waters of the Gulf Stream. But yeah, so take a look at that. Uh, look at that at map to kind of see what we're talking about. Due to the uh, UK is up here kind of with like further north than, say, Toronto, Canada. It's, it's really kind of equal with the southern part of Alaska, whereas like even the northern United States is even with Spain. But Spain's weather is more like Florida's the temperate waters of the Gulf Stream. But it generally doesn't get that hot in both countries during the summer, and most true. homes in both don't have air conditioning. Also that true. said, in recent years, more and more are investing in them as- You have to understand that if you take a trip to the UK, in the summer especially, if it's gonna be hot, don't expect there to be air conditioning in your hotel. Most places don't have it. None of the hotels I've stayed in in the UK have ever had air conditioning. Uh, and we had our windows open even in the middle of the night and we were still roasting. And that's true for a lot of places in Europe too. It has got dramatically warmer in the summers in both. When we were in Scotland last June, it kind of sucked not having air conditioning. Then again, we're spoiled Americans. Anyway, both generally get a lot of precipitation. That said, the further west you go in both, generally the more rainfall. Both are more diverse places. But I will say this, the UK, the, the rain thing is a little overblown. They really don't get that much more rain than a lot of other places. And my first two weeks in the UK, we saw rain for 20 minutes the entire two weeks we were there. And that was over in Whitechapel waiting for a Jack the Ripper tour to start. Uh, and it didn't even rain in the west side of London where the rest of my family was. My daughter and I were there for the tour. So they never saw any rain in the two weeks we were there than most folks realize. Both are growing mainly due to people moving to both from other countries. True. The biggest religion in both is Christianity, specifically Protestant Christianity. More specifically, most Christians in England are members of the Church of England. While many Christians in Scotland are Roman Catholic, most are members of the Church of Scotland. Farming is big in both, with crop growing, generally more in the eastern portion of both and livestock raising generally more common in the western portions both have Cheap, lots yeah. of castles both have some of the oldest and most respected universities in the world sure scotland's got the university of glasgow university of st andrews university of aberdeen and university of edinburgh but england's got oxford. imperial college london university cambridge. college london oxford and cambridge for goodness sake oxford and cambridge both are two of the oldest universities in the world how are england and scotland different well before we get into the differences i'm going to tell you about yougov YouGov is my favorite way to take surveys and make extra cash and rewards. I originally started using it when I was stuck in line somewhere. I think the DMV or something. But it's just a great, quick way to answer questions and get rewarded for it. Interesting. Often I take YouGov surveys on the toilet. That reminds me, I still need to clean my phone. Matt, can I just say thank you for having your pants up in the video on the toilet? Anyway, YouGov is free to join and so easy to get extra cash it can be an easy side hustle tap my link in the description of this video to start taking surveys and earning cash through YouGov thanks to YouGov for sponsoring this video okay where were we ah yes what are the differences between Scotland and England England is bigger, specifically 1.7 times bigger. Population's about 10 times. It also has a though. lot more freaking people, specifically more than 10 yep. times more people. Goodness. Eight and a good chunk of the people in Scotland live in the southern part. Like, uh, there's a real natural divide between the highlands and the lowlands, and most of the people live in the lowlands, specifically Edinburgh and Glasgow. 10 UK residents live in England. Well, no wonder it gets most of the attention. England has a much higher population density. England border. And I should point out too that uh, it didn't used to be that diverse, the population difference. England's population has grown exponentially compared to Scotland's and Ireland. Ireland's population, which I know we're not talking about here, is just now getting back to where it was before the potato famine. Uh, that's how devastated they were between deaths and emigration. 
uh, to where it took them 150 years to get back 170 years. Uh, but yeah, England has grown substantially at a faster rate, and a lot of that is because of immigration. There's Wales, Scotland doesn't. Being further north, Scotland is colder and thus... Hey, I'm visiting Wales for the first time in a couple of weeks. I'm going to go see Wrexham play on February 10th, so I'm excited about that. It's way more snow and darker days in the winter. Scotland has three distinct geographic areas. The Highlands, the Lowlands, and the Southern Uplands. As the names suggest, the Highlands are high, marked by the biggest mountains on the island. The Lowlands are, uh low er and are marked by relatively flat plains and the southern uplands are up well kind of they're a yeah so uh ben nevis is the highest uh mountain in britain and it's uh it's in scotland it's uh right outside of fort william a really hilly region along the southern border with england and yep scotland that's is I, that's the isle of sky right there i think uh, maybe not. I think it is, and though. It has the majority of mountains in the UK. It has Ben Nevis, the highest mountain in the British Isles. England is generally lower and flatter than the rest of the United Kingdom, but hey, it has a bit of mountains too, eh? Around here and here, Scotland has more coastline. It also has way more lakes, or as the locals Locks. call them, lochs. For example, you may have heard of Loch Ness, home of the mythical Loch Ness monster. 90% of all Fresh water in Great Britain is in Scotland. But and not only that, but Loch Ness, and I couldn't believe this when I heard it. We were at Loch Ness and we found this out, and it's absolutely true. Loch Ness has more fresh water than all of the other lakes in the entire Great Britain combined. That's crazy to me, but that's because it's it's so deep, because it's really not that big. Uh, it's long, and it's not that wide, but it's so deep that it just it's that's nuts but most of the longest rivers in great britain run through england including one of the most famous thames. rivers in the world the river thames and i should point out if you ever find yourself talking about like london bridge this is not london bridge that is tower bridge why because it's right next to the tower of london uh london bridge is down a little further and it's a pretty boring looking bridge the original london bridge or the, the the one that was there before is actually in lake havasu arizona now uh this one was built i want to say like 100 years ago which runs through london oh that looks quite familiar parliament more of scotland is considered wilderness and it's definitely more sparsely populated hey but england has more national parks humans have been around in england for way longer than scotland oh yeah let's get into some history you know what let's get help from a local this time so that on the top right there that's actually the scottish parliament uh when, when we stayed in edinburgh our Airbnb was almost right across the street from there. Uh, and yeah, there were kids playing in these little pools here, but that Scottish Parliament up behind there, you have Salisbury Crags and then uh, Arthur's Seat. Uh, Edinburgh's built on this uh, extinct volcano. And that's where you have like these areas that stick up, including the one that Edinburgh Castle's on. It's a beautiful city, really cool history there. Oh, thanks, Mr. Beat. Hi guys, I'm Ralph, and I'll be covering the history of these two wonderful countries, so let's get right into it. As mentioned by Mr. Beat, England has been settled for quite a bit longer than Scotland, since 500,000 years ago. Humans have only been around in Scotland for around 14,000 years. In the years BC, the British Isles were settled almost entirely by a multitude of Celtic tribes. Then 54 BC rolls around, and Julius Caesar, you might have heard of him, lands on the Isles. And over the next hundred years or so, the Romans fully conquer most of modern-day England, which is almost certainly the main reason we see such differences in England and Scotland's cultures today. Famously, Hadrian's Wall was built in the second century, although on a map it might not reflect the modern border of the countries. It yeah, and uh, I've said this in other videos, uh, there's so much mix of culture and place names and you know, here in the United States we think of ourselves as a melting pot of all these different cultures who have come here, but England has that too. And um, to a lesser degree, Scotland, because you've got the uh, the Britons, the B-R-I-T-O-N-S, Britons, uh, who were there. Uh, you had the Celts. You have uh, the Roman 
culture comes in when the Romans invade and, and push through up towards Scotland. You've got the Anglo-Saxons who come in a few centuries later. You've got the uh, the Viking uh, culture uh, on the East Coast, especially in places like York and Northumbria. And all of that kind of gets mixed together. And then, of course, the, the Normans come from France. It does yet again show the cultural divide. Much of the wall is still intact, by the way. Around 383 AD, the Romans left Britain since they could no longer defend themselves against Germanic tribes in Western Europe, though their influences obviously stuck around. Both Scotland and England remained mostly Celtic until the 500s, when there was an enormous influence of immigration from Northern Europe, specifically the Angles, Saxons, and Jutes. Altogether, they became known as Anglo-Saxons. Sorry, Jutes. After the Romans, these laid the foundation for not only English culture, but the language itself. Angles, Anglish, English. Around this time, both Scotland... Yeah, England is Angloland. Scotland and England were divided between several groups. In England, you had Northumbria, Mercia, and Wessex, to name a few. And in Scotland, you had Fotla, Kate, and Dunbar, among others. Of course, then came the Vikings, arriving in Lindisfarne in northeast England in the year 793. Who had so you can see an example of all of that just with the city of York. Uh, York, under the Romans, was Iboricum, and it's actually in York that Constantine is declared emperor by his men. Uh, there's a, a memorial to that, a statue uh, commemorating that right outside of York Minster. Uh, and then York becomes Jorvik for the Vikings, and then York for the English. A massive influence over the next few centuries. They mostly invaded parts of Scotland first, notably its isles on its west coast, before in the mid 9th century moving on to establishing Norse kingdoms all across the north and east of England. By the turn of the millennium, these Viking settlements were largely pushed out of England, though it would still take until around the year 1260 to yep. push them out of Scotland. Scotland was likely the first of the two countries to establish a monarchy, its first being Kenneth I, who had been King of the Picts. Many people don't realise the Kingdom of Scotland existed, off and on, but mostly on, from 843 all the way to 1707. Sometime in the early years of the Kingdom of Scotland, England Yeah, with all the talk right now of uh, there's kind of an independence movement a little bit in Scotland, uh, it's failed so far, but it's got significant support. Uh, Scotland was independent far longer than it's been united with England, so uh, it's not that big a stretch for them if they did choose to go back to that got a monarch for the first time, through the lineage of the famed and legendary King Arthur of the Anglo-Saxons, who were for valiantly defending Britain against the much stronger armies of the Vikings. Famously, England was invaded and subsequently conquered in 1066 by a certain William the Conqueror, whose lineage would go on to become the English monarchy we know and love today. More notably, the Norman invasion changed England from a largely Celtic and Germanic nation to one with a large French and Latin influence. Which yeah, if you look at the, just the, the place names and the, the, the people's names, how much they change uh, from being very Anglo-Saxon in origin to being French Norman. Uh, and remember, too, that the Normans, at least in part, were Viking themselves. They were the Northmen, uh, and they were given that territory of Normandy to basically placate them so that they wouldn't keep invading. And um, by the time of 1066, though, uh, William the Conqueror, or William the Bastard, as he was known, uh, was very heavily French in most of the lines of his ancestry. But they bring that to England, and they uh, William the Conqueror goes out about basically systematically destroying the old infrastructure and culture and replacing it with a very heavily Norman culture, builds a bunch of castles to really kind of put a stamp on things. For the next 300 years, the language of the English court is going to be French. It's only when uh, Henry IV comes along and overthrows Richard II that it switches over to English. Shows England to be the cultural and linguistic melting pot of sorts of pre-Renaissance Europe. By contrast, Scotland remained mostly Celtic. Well, until England started invading it. England invaded Scotland many times from the 900s all the way up to the 1600s. Often, England would take it over and then Scotland would re-establish its independence and then the whole thing would repeat itself, as history sometimes does. Notably, England invaded Scotland in 1296, an invasion in which Edward I of England led an army Long across shanks. the border, starting the confusingly named First War of Scottish Independence. This included the famed Battle of Stirling Bridge, the Scots led by the guy from Braveheart. Sons of Scotland! And it's, yeah, it's, it's, Independence wars are always an interesting thing to describe because, uh, for example, we call the American Revolution the revolution when really it's, it's a uh, war of independence. 
Uh, in Scotland's case, they were already independent. They were just fighting to stay independent. And uh, yeah, there was some overlordship by England and all of that. So I guess you could kind of argue that it was a war for independence. But Scotland was always technically a separate country, even if the King of England kind of claimed lordship over it. I am William Wallace. Okay, William Wallace. There were dozens of conflicts between the two nations over the next hundred years or so, including invasions of Scotland in the 1540s known as the War of the Rough Wooing at the command of Henry VIII, where Scotland's capital city of Edinburgh was burned down. This, of course, is what fueled the intense rivalry of the two independent countries fighting over an island for centuries. Which is fascinating, then, when you think about the fact that uh, the royal family of Scotland were Henry's relatives. Henry's brother-in-law was King James IV. His, his sister was married to James IV, and it was actually through them that uh, the crowns of England and Scotland are going to be united through their descendants. In 1603, James VI of Scotland succeeded English Queen Elizabeth I as King of England, which made the two countries share a monarch. Then came some more chaotic times in England, which, to oversimplify, tensions got so bad between the generally Protestant supporters of the English Parliament and the generally Catholic supporters of the monarchy under Charles I that a series of civil wars occurred from 1642 to 1651. This resulted in the monarchy of both England and Scotland being disbanded, as England became ruled by Oliver Cromwell as its... Yeah, people forget that Scotland had a role in the English Civil War. They were a part of all of that. ...protector until his death in 1658, where Charles I's son came back to rule as king. By the late 1600s, Scotland decided to join in with other Western European countries, like England, by starting a colony in the New World. Oh, come on. You're just gonna gloss over all the English colonies like that? They were kind of a big deal. Oh uh, dear. Um, England had had tremendous success with its colonies in North America, in particular. Well, that's an understatement. It became that's Plymouth. Rich. That is the uh, Plymouth Plantation. Uh, I think it's called Plymouth Pawtuxet uh, now because uh, they also have a Native American uh, settlement there that you can tour. It's a really cool experience. You have actors playing all the real people who lived there, speaking with the real accent they would have had at the time. Pretty neat to visit. The Scots set one up in Panama, but this didn't really work out for a multitude of reasons, and it left 80% of Scottish participants dead. This scheme was backed by about a fifth of the entire Scottish economy, and its failure left the entire Scottish lowlands in financial ruin. This was a big reason why Scotland finally decided to join England in the Act of Union 1707. Since then, both countries have been part of the United Kingdom, which, while having its government in London, has elected officials proportional to the populations of areas within the country, so Scotland has always had had at least some representation, which was furthered in 1999 when it was given its own devolved government, which Mr. B will go into later. And boy did Scotland type that right. Over the next more than 200 years, the United Kingdom was the top world superpower, building the biggest empire the world has ever seen. As the two countries have existed side by side, England has seemed to grow both in population and economy much faster, especially with the growth of London in the 1800s. Yeah. Around 20% of Scots migrated to other parts of the British Empire from the mid-1800s to the mid-1900s. I mean, put this in perspective. Greater London has a population about double the entire nation of Scotland. <laughs> so that gives you an idea. It's notably Canada and Australia. Though this population has been balanced out by immigrants arriving mostly from Ireland and mainland Europe. I'm rambling on, but in short, historically both countries have been fierce rivals for a multitude of reasons separating them from the start, from the Romans to the Vikings, and both countries have been some of the most influential on the world stage in the past couple of centuries together as part of the United Kingdom. Thank you, my Scottish local. Today both countries- So that countries was a view from, I think that looked like it was probably Salisbury Crags uh, overlooking Edinburgh. ...remain the richest in the world. Major industries in England include technology, finance, professional services, and manufacturing. Major industries in Scotland also include professional services and manufacturing, as well as construction. Tourism is also quite big in both. England is growing at a faster rate. One big reason why is because more immigrants have yeah. moved to England in recent years due to having a growing 
growing foreign-born population, England has become a much more diverse country in recent years than Scotland. The cost of living is higher on average in England. Related to this, folks in England, generally speaking, earn more money than folks in Scotland. That said, the poverty rate is lower in Scotland. Related to this, the crime rate is also lower in Scotland. Higher income residents of Scotland do pay a higher percentage income tax than higher income residents of England. England has London, so uh, that's gonna give it a huge advantage or also disadvantage, depending on how you look at it, I guess, if you don't like people. Ah, yes, London. You've heard of it? Among the richest and most visited cities in the world is that place Jay Foreman wanders about. With a metro population of nearly 15 million, yep. it's the biggest city in the United Kingdom, and its capital, of course, in addition to being where the UK's government meets. And for a long time, the largest city in the world. It's got most of the iconic attractions we associate with the entire island. You know, Buckingham Palace, Big Bang. Matt, you did not just say Buckingham Palace. Come on, man. It's Buckingham. And the Tower Bridge, stuff like that. Anyway, this video is There's not about London, but England and Scotland. So enough of that. I'm sure if you live in England, you're just Saint about Paul's? peeved that London always gets all the attention anyway. Crazy enough, Metro London's population is nearly three times that of Scotland. Yep. Scotland's largest city is not its capital. Glasgow, Glasgow, which has more than eight times fewer people than London. Despite being so much smaller, it still has around a third of Scotland's population. Three out of every five Scots live in this little area of the country. And if you're wondering, the Joker, you know, the iconic kind of sliced, that's called a Glasgow smile. Big gang problems uh, throughout history in Glasgow, and that was something they would do. In fact, there's a, a prominent actor, I forget his name, but he was in, um, uh, in Gladiator, for example. He has the scars of having been given a Glasgow smile in either the Glasgow or Edinburgh metro area. Oh yeah, Edinburgh is Scotland's capital. And while London gets more tourists, Edinburgh is the second most visited city in the UK and has much more of its older buildings in its city center preserved. If you ever get the chance to visit Old Town and the- There's St. Giles Cathedral there. If you followed the events of the queen, when she died, she, uh, before they took her back to London, she was first- brought to St. Giles Cathedral, which is right on what's called the Royal Mile, which is kind of at the top of the Royal Mile, you have Edinburgh Castle. And then if you just walk down that road in that direction, it's all downhill. It goes down to Holyrood Palace at the base and Parliament's right there. Royal Mile in particular, you should, I highly recommend, 10 out of 10. Scotland yes. as a whole, in fact, has more old buildings still intact. The Knapp of Hower on the island of Papa Westre in Orkney, Scotland, is the oldest preserved stone house not only in the UK, but all of Northern Europe. It dates back as far as 3700 BC, which is more than- Yeah, I really want to get to Scara Bray, which is up there in the Northern Isles. Uh, fascinating history there. And a thousand years before the earliest Egyptian pyramids were built. Hey, speaking of old stuff, England has Stonehenge. These mysteriously placed 13 feet by 7 feet, 25 ton stones. Stonehenge is also one of the most famous prehistoric spots in the world, but hardly anyone knows about Scotland's Callanish stones. Scotland has Scarabray, there it is. the most preserved Neolithic village in all of Europe. Europe. England has a higher life expectancy. Scotland hmm. is less religious. In Scotland, you are considered to be legally an adult if you are at least 16 years old. You're legally an adult at 18 in England, as well as the rest of the UK for that matter, and most of the rest of the world. Scotland has a, quote, devolved government, which means its government has devolved <laughs> into madness. Just kidding. 
It just means Scots have a bit more self-governance than England. Being a legal adult at 16 is an example of that. Scots are generally more left-leaning yeah. politically. When citizens of the UK voted on whether or not to leave the European Union back in 2016, aka Brexit, Scots overwhelmingly voted to stay in the European Union, while most of England, excluding London, voted to leave. Which is what has led to these renewed calls for independence because Scotland wanted to stay in the EU. The European Union. Historically, there was much more of a rivalry between England and Scotland, but these days, that rivalry seems to revolve mostly around sports. There's the football, aka soccer, rivalry between the national football teams of both countries. Dating back to 1872, it's football's oldest rivalry. England leads the all-time series, but 26 of the games between the two ended in ties. There's also a big rugby yep. rivalry between the two countries. Cricket is a popular sport in both countries, but way bigger in England. Heck, the sport was even invented there. And rounders was invented there. Rounders, which is apparently different from cricket. Oh yeah, rugby and the modern form of football were also invented in England. Oh yeah, well the modern form of golf Scot was yep. invented in Scotland. Eh. England is where the language that I'm speaking to you right now originated. Yep, the English started speaking the most spoken language in the world, English, in England. Now, what? some of you might take exception to him saying it's the most spoken language in the world. It is not the most spoken native language in the world. There are more native speakers of, say, Mandarin Chinese, for example. Uh, but yeah, more people speak English in the world than any other language because a lot of people have English as their second language. A lot of people ask me, well, you know, how do you get around Europe not knowing the languages? Um, and, and, you know, I, I know a little bit of French, a little bit of Spanish for, I mean, a little bit of uh, Spanish and a little bit of German, for example. But by and large, 95% of the people that you encounter in, in Europe, at least in Western Europe, speak English. A surprise, right? Approximately 1.5 billion people speak English today, making it the world's most spoken language. Do you understand what I'm telling you right now? Well, if you speak English, you do. Now that said, I'm specifically talking about modern English. Right. No, not the band, the language. Modern English evolved from early Middle English, as did Scots, a language unique to Scotland, of course. You hear it more in these parts of the country. Many and mostly these parts of Scotland speak Scottish Gaelic. Mostly though- And it's important to note that, like you may have heard it pronounced Gaelic. Gaelic is in Ireland. In Scotland, it's Gaelic. You'll just hear Scottish English wherever you go in the country. Down here in Southwest England, Cornish. specifically the county of Cornwall, several also speak a language called Cornish. While there is definitely a distinct and almost stereotypical Scottish accent, there are like dozens of different accents in England. I gotta say right now, I just as someone whose family comes from Birmingham, I gotta thank Matt for choosing to use a shot of Birmingham in this. This is downtown Birmingham. That is St. Martin's in the Bullring Church. My family came from that church. I, I went there and prayed in that church last year when I was there. Uh, I had family who were married in that church. Uh, this is the Bull Ring, which is a big shopping center right there. Uh, it's really at the very center of Birmingham. And when he talks about the different uh, accents in England, a lot of people say that the Brummie accent, which is in Birmingham, is like the worst accent in England. It's also one of the most challenging. If you ever watch the show Peaky Blinders, that's the accent they're speaking there. And it's a, it's a difficult accent. Elton John was made in England. He was indeed. See, I told you he was, but not just Elton John. Some of the most influential and popular bands yeah. and musicians in world history came from England. The Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Kinks, the Who, Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, Pink Floyd, Queen, The Clash, 
The Sex Pistols, Joy Division, The Smiths, Iron Maiden, Deep Purple, Depeche Mode, Radiohead, Blur, Bee Gees, Genesis, The Cure, Oasis, Coldplay, David Bowie, Eric Clapton, Adele, and Ed Sheeran, just to name a very few. Holy freaking crap. They all came from England? That's a bit overwhelming. What the heck is going on with England? Even though a ton of great music the Proclaimers. came out of Scotland, today it's mostly known more for one-hit wonders, at least internationally. England gave us William Shakespeare, Jane Austen, Charles Dickens, J.K. Rowling, and George... Although a lot of J.K. Rowling's influence came from Scotland. If you go to Edinburgh, there's a, a cemetery there. Uh, Greyfriars and you walk around and a lot of the names that's where Tom Riddle is buried that's where you see McGonagall that's where you see Potter uh, a lot of the name ideas she got for that series came from that cemetery Orwell Scotland gave us Robert Burns in fact Burns is Scotland's national poet and on January 25th Scots all honor him with the traditional Burns supper Bur don't forget Adam Smith though from Scotland, uh, kind of one of the fathers of modern capitalism. Burns Night, baby! The actor, Ewan McGregor, and the novelist, Robert Louis Stevenson, are also from Scotland. Well, Stevenson passed away back in 1894, in case you haven't heard. England has more UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Scotland has 32 subdivisions known as council areas. England has nine regions, further divided into 48 ceremonial counties. Heck, even further divided into 84 metropolitan and non-metropolitan counties. Heck, even further divided into 296 districts. Heck, even further divided into 10,449 civil parishes. Goodness. What am I? Jay Foreman? Scotland has <laughs> haggis. And while fish and chips is popular all across the UK, most say it's superior down in England. Scotland gave us scotch whiskey, while tea rules in England. Overall, Scotland seems to have a more distinct identity than True. England. Much of that is And based I think part of that is because there's such a diverse culture in England compared to Scotland. That, I believe is on the Isle of Sky. On being a Celtic nation, you know, bagpipes. There's definitely more bagpipes in Scotland. And you know, kilts. That's where kilts originated. To wrap up, I know I just listed off a bunch of differences, but these days England and Scotland are not as different as you might think. True. Each passing year, the Scots and the English are more like brothers than enemies. But with all brothers, there is always sibling rivalry. Oh, Shout I wondered out to if it was Ralph more. from the channel Osbers Gaming for helping me with the history portion of this video. Yeah, great stuff. Uh, I really enjoyed that. I love both countries. Uh, I, I make no secret of the fact that I'm an Anglophile, but I'm also very heavily in love with Scotland. My kids are obsessed with Scotland and getting back there as soon as possible. Hoping to make that happen at some point soon. But, uh, and of course I have family ties in both places. So, I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Let me know your thoughts, uh, especially our friends from England and Scotland. Let me know what he got right, what he got wrong, what you would add to that. Uh, let's talk about it a little more. So, uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks for watching.